morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. We just will touch on a few things that we always go through every Sunday. Um, remember to sign in on the red pew pads, and inside those pew pads are your um, joys and blessings and concern slips. Please fill them out. We want to say welcome to everyone who's out there online and watching us this morning. Um, announcements for today are the 5K Hunger Walk is today. Didn't it rain last yeah. time you played this too? Yeah, right. <laughs> but it made it, it makes it all better, so it's not too hot. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Um, Monday is a finance meeting on Zoom at 6.30. Uh, I'm not sure, but on the bulletin it says that there is an outreach meeting on Tuesday at 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall. Is that correct? Because it wasn't on this list here. Okay. Wednesday is a prayer group on the stage at 1 p.m. A reminder that the Tigers ball game was canceled due to lack of um, participation. And all of June, you get two miles for every chapter that you read. I'm not sure where we're at. Who does that? Over the water yet? Oh my goodness. So <clears throat> if I get a little forced now and then I apologize and keep losing my voice. So okay, if you would um, join me in the call to worship, please stand. <coughs> God's call is like the clear sounding of a bell that raises us to our feet. Born by the eyes of a child, that we reach out our souls, the fragrance of the free freedom that will fall away. The invisible touch of Jesus that heals our hurts. God's call is still ringing in this world. God's love is surrounding us now and allowing us to sing. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah. Last week we, we gave out our um, United Women of Faith special recognition pins. And one of our most special people was not here because she was having some issues. So this week I want to recognize Dolores Schweitzer as being the longest member in the United Methodist Church, or United Methodist Women, now the United Women of Faith. And we'd like to recognize you with this small pin with a pearl. And, uh, In case you didn't hear, that's a, a pin of recognition for the United Women of Faith, and Dolores wasn't here last week to receive it. So you may be seated also. Although she had just died, 
But um, they were crying and they were playing flutes and stuff, which was part of their tradition when somebody died at that time. And he sent them away and he told her, told them she was just sleeping. And they kind of laughed about that because, you know, they had seen what had happened. But Jesus made it better, brought her back to life. And he didn't mind at all that, <clears throat> that he was interrupted because he was able to still use his power and do all that he intended to. Much like we this afternoon are going to do a ministry. We're going to help people and the rain has come along, but it's not going to interrupt the good that we're doing. And Jesus wants us to do what he would do to help people, even if sometimes it does get interrupted. And let's pray. And gracious God, we thank you for your healing power. We thank you for your call, asking us to do as you would do, to do good for other people and to know that you're with us when we're struggling. And we thank you that even when the things in our lives interrupt the ministries that you would have happen, you find ways to make it work and your power still does good for us and in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's see, is this, I can tell if it's working. And while I take a minute to readjust this, I know that one of our prayer requests is a joy and the person wants to share verbally. So Pat, would you share with us? Yes, yes I will. Whoops. <laughs> oh, there we go. Good. Thank you for getting your microphone. Um, I just want to say to the entire congregation, whether you were here last Sunday or not, thank you for the most surprised party I've ever had in my life. <laughs> um, I hope that any of you and, and people watching online and people, you know, that weren't here, would understand that you were more than welcome. The whole congregation was welcome to come and have coffee and pastries that were set out for the church congregation. Um, at my surprise party that my daughter and family from Georgia put on for me um, because I turned 80. And so, and it, yeah, hey, she thought that was a big deal. But I want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank people who helped her and stayed in contact. She was able to stay in contact with Linda. You were great help to her, I understand. Pam, you held me up when I needed to be held up. And um, Brenda, Pastor Brenda, thank you for finding out that she could use the fellowship hall. She was very appreciative of that. And Mary Brown, if you're watching, thank you for all the contact that you had with my daughter. And I hope that you all that did come enjoyed yourselves. And after the pastries and coffee, you are more than welcome to stay for the taco bar. <laughs> but, Anyway, I didn't lose it and became a blubbering, as I told Pastor Brenda <coughs> this morning. I didn't lose it and become a blubbering idiot until I saw my grandson, Pavel, run to me. And then I lost it, I admit it. But thank you all. I appreciate your love. Nancy, I understand now why you asked me to be a reader. <laughs> and I don't see Anne today. Um, she is. Now I know why we stood at the front. Um, so I wouldn't see people coming in from the back. 
So again, thank you from the bottom of my heart and from my family. I appreciate everything. <laughs> Happy birthday, that really was fun. In fact, we almost did an announcement the week before so that everybody would know, because you had been, watching, been sharing with us online, and I said, if she's not here and she's sharing online, we can use, leave the sound off on the live stream until I've made an announcement for the people here to hear it and then get started with the live stream. But you walked in just as we were getting that arranged, so we didn't make that announcement. I'm glad it still went off so well. Um, okay, so the ones we have in writing, uh, it looks like Joanne, I'm going to say Gastrizac, yes, something like that, <laughs> okay, um, a prayer for the rain, and we need, we have needed the rain badly, thankfully it is just raining, not storming, so we can go ahead with the 5K this afternoon, um, one that says prayers for my niece Carol, and then I have several this week. Um, I happen to have a birthday this week too, and thank you for the cards and, and emails and the Facebook wishes and the flowers that came from the church, whoever was involved in that. Thank you for that. Uh, I also am celebrating an anniversary today. I did my first sermon as pastor 23 years ago today. So I'm <laughs> And some of you have been noticing over time that I'm wearing a brace on my ankle, and if, just in case you have been concerned about that, that's not a recent injury. I've injured that ankle a lot, and it really is just there to support some muscles and things while they strengthen back up. I'm also doing some physical therapy, so thank you for the concern about that. It's not a big concern. Um, I want to thank those of you who have been praying for my friend Jody from earlier in the week. So if you're in the prayer group or if you're on the prayer chain, I think you got that message. She had a scary memory episode at conference on Sunday. And they kept her in the hospital overnight, sent her home. She had transient global amnesia. So it, it was a scary thing, did not turn out to be as serious as we thought it might have been. So thank you for those prayers. Also, if you uh, got the news about Greg Crowell, he is home from the hospital. He had multiple things going on, but sounds like he's getting better. Annual conference, we had the sad occasion of voting on 60 churches disaffiliating, a number of pastors also who disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church, and nine churches closing. So that is quite the concern. Um, and I will ask you to continue to keep the church in your prayers for those kind of things. Aside from that, this was one of the best conferences I've been to, and I don't know when. So thanks for the, the worship and everything that, that occurred at conference otherwise. My nephew Edgar is in the hospital with a bad infection that started with an infected hair follicle. And he will be in the hospital for probably a month while they treat it. Um, his grandmother on the other side of the family, her name is Ruby Irvin. Um, she's not been on life support per se, but they have removed everything except what will keep her comfortable. She's somewhere around 95 years old, so she probably will not be with us long. Uh, so keep the Irvin family in your prayers. And also Jack Frederick, who I have asked you to pray for before. He had health issues and they couldn't identify them. He has liver cancer and they've I don't know what his prognosis as far as time or whatever is going to be, but there's not a lot that they can do for him. So prayers for him uh, and for his friend Diane, who is one of his major caregivers. So yeah, lots going on. And thankfully, some of them are joys and celebrations. And let us pray together. God of life, we do thank you for this day and for the nourishing rain that we have needed so badly. We ask for your presence in this service, your presence for those whose 
needs are on our hearts and minds this day that maybe we have not shared with the congregation, but we share them with you, knowing that you are already at work. We thank you for the ministry of the 5K event this afternoon and pray your presence during the event and with the results and, and the blessing that that ministry can become for those who are in need. We thank you for our opportunity to come before you in this space, whether physical or, or online. We thank you that you hear us, that you speak to us, that you touch us with your healing and comfort and strength where we find need for such things, that you celebrate with us as we celebrate milestones, as we spend time together and recognize the joy of of being together with loved ones. We do pray for those who are hurting this day, who need your healing touch, for those who need your touch like Carol and Joanne, like Edgar and Ruby. We thank you for the healing that Jody has experienced and Greg and ask that you continue to be with them for Jack and um, his diagnosis of liver cancer. And Lord, in all of these cases where healing is needed, we know that there are, there are doctors and professionals who have answered your call to do your healing work and we give thanks for them and pray too that they would know your presence in the ways that they have need. And we know that there are family and friends and loved ones who grieve, who serve, who support, and we thank you for your work that they do as well. And as we spend our time together this morning, may we hear your word as you have it for us this day. And all of this we ask in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's stand as we're able, and sing once more. It's number 451, if you'd like to follow along. sections of Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13, and 18 to 26. 
As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. And beginning with verse 18. While he was saying these things, and in the, mid, in the meantime, in the verses we did not read, he was being questioned about fasting and had answered those questions. So in verse 18, while he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith, <coughs> excuse me, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put aside, or outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. According to Homiletics Online, which is a preaching resource, Pastor Scott Herr tells the story of a great big guy in full leather, bandana, beard, and tattoos who sat proudly at a traffic light on his absolutely gorgeous Harley Davidson bike. This was one of the most beautiful motorcycles in town, not to mention fast. Everything about it displayed power. It was at that moment an older man in his 80s drove up on a moped. He commented on what a beautiful bike the Harley was. Mind if I take a look, said the older gentleman. Go ahead, came the grunted reply. This sure is a beautiful bike, said the older man. He got within inches of the bike and went over it from top to bottom. Bet it's fast, too. You bet, said the owner. With that, the light turned green and the biker popped a wheelie racing off down the road. Zero to a hundred in no time flat. Grinning, he looked back to see the older man was just a speck in his mirror. Suddenly, however, the speck grew larger and larger until the man on the moped went flying past him at an incredible speed. It was amazing. The older man kept going until he was just a speck in the distance now in front of the Harley Davidson. He turned and headed back right toward the Harley. Again, he went zooming past the Harley, this time in the opposite direction, until again he was just a speck in the mirror. The biker brought the Harley to a screeching halt, deciding he was going to wait for the older man. The moped came up from behind with amazing speed and slammed right into the back of the Harley, crushing both vehicles. The man was thrown from the moped onto the ground and lay there stunned. The biker started to say, what's going on, but stopped, realizing the man might need help. Old man, are you okay? What can I do to help? To which the man replied, you could start by unhooking my suspenders from your Harley. <laughs> <laughs> the moral of the story is simply this. Who we are connected to determines to a great extent where we are going in life. 
Matthew tells us about three people who connected themselves with Jesus by faith and experienced his power, his power of persuasion, transformation, and resurrection. First, we see Matthew, and this is possibly, and maybe even probably, the gospel writer himself. He's working away in his office at the first century Roman IRS, using his meticulous attention to detail to do a job that leaves his fellow Jews feeling somewhat betrayed because he's working for Rome. And no matter what was true about him personally, he had developed a reputation as a cheater or a thief, one who charged too much to taxpayers and pocketed the extra. Then along comes Jesus. Jesus persuades Matthew to come away from the office to follow him. And like some of the other stories of Jesus' early disciples being called, we see that by faith, Matthew dropped his calculator and his office keys and he left with Jesus. No other questions asked according to the story. Later, Jesus showed transformative power when he and his disciples dined at the same table with not just Matthew, who we know is a tax collector, but also with other tax collectors and those simply named as sinners. Jesus appeared to the religious leaders as though he were condoning the cheating, the stealing, the impurity that his dinner companions were known for. Instead, Jesus said he had come to save sinners, not to condone the sin, but to meet them where they are, love them, and transform them. While the legalistic Pharisees and religious leaders were all sinners in their own way, they didn't see any need for the salvation that Jesus offered. They knew and followed every rule to the letter. And they made sure others did too. The tax collectors and those called simply sinners at the table with Jesus expressed a willingness to admit their sin, change their ways and connect themselves to Jesus for forgiveness and salvation. Religious leaders tended to deny their guilt so that it remained in the way of their relationship with Jesus. Now, while Jesus was still talking to all those around him who would listen, a leader of the synagogue, known as Jairus, according to Luke's version of the story, but unnamed here in Matthew, comes in distraught over the very recent death of his about 12-year-old daughter. Again, that age comes from the story in Luke. He pulls Jesus away. Jesus was his only chance to bring life back to the daughter. He begs Jesus to come lay hands on her, trusting in Jesus' death-defeating, resurrecting power to bring her back to life with a simple touch. Jesus follows Jairus, and on the way he encounters a faith-filled woman who was so desperate for healing after 12 years of bleeding that she reached out to touch the fringe of Jesus' cloak. The simple act of touching the fringe of his cloak, especially by a woman, defied the law especially since the bleeding disorder made the woman unclean. It was believed that one simple touch from her could defile Jesus, making him, making him need to offer sacrifices and complete cleansing rituals before participating any further in social or religious activities. But desperate times call for desperate measures. She trusts that she can somehow be cured of her horrible hemorrhages by connecting with even Jesus' garment. Jesus senses her touch and turns quickly. He doesn't scold her or send her away like others might. And he is not defiled because that's not the way Jesus' power works. He comforts her 
a loving term. He calls her daughter. And the assurance that her faith in reaching out had made her well. After restoring life to the desperate, ill woman, Jesus continues on to the house of the leader of the synagogue, where he finds the, the early stages of a funeral of sorts going on, with mourners playing flutes and wailing in grief. Jesus crashes the funeral, sends the people outside with the laughable news that the girl's only sleeping. Once they go outside and the commotion dies down, Jesus takes the girl by the hand, a connection that restores her to life by Jesus' death-defeating power. Jesus' power of persuasion calls unlikely candidates to do the work of God in the world. Unlikely candidates like Matthew, like any one of us, at any given time. Jesus came for us unlikely candidates, the too often unrighteous, the lost who need to be found, more than he comes for people who stubbornly claim that they have all the righteousness they need in their degrees or possessions or status. Whether we're in the IRS office along the road, reaching for the one who might restore what we've lost, or even on our deathbeds. Jesus can meet us right where we are, inviting us to connect with him. Will you be persuaded to turn from whatever separates you from him toward the life he has for you? Will you trust him to direct you, encourage you, and teach you? Jesus shows transformative power by calling sinners. Will we confess and repent of our sin and accept Jesus' power to forgive and transform us? Will we use our gifts for the work of transformation? supporting ministries that help people who struggle with food insecurity, much like the ministry we're helping with this afternoon? Will we support ministries that help those who have illnesses, even maybe like HIV? Or what about supporting those who face abuse or addictions? Jesus heals and restores life. We can reach out to him in prayer in our desperate moments where we find anything in the world draining the life out of us. Will we trust Jesus to restore life and joy? Like the one we will call Jairus, though Matthew does not name him, will we go to Jesus on behalf of others, extending love toward the one that is seeking healing is the first step toward their wellness being restored. Love doesn't directly cause healing, but an environment of love is the only environment where healing really can occur. By faith and prayer, let us connect ourselves and our loved ones to Jesus and be ready to see where he will take us. And let us pray. And gracious God, we thank you that our needs and our prayers do not interrupt your work, but are parts of the way you show your glory in our world. Continue to call to us, to heal us, to support us, to equip us for the work you have for us to do. We thank you for your power, your power that persuades, that transforms, and that overcomes illness and even death. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. 
Amen. One thing I was going to share at announcement time, and didn't think to let Linda know that I, that I needed that minute, and it has to do with the sermons. Starting, I, I will put the can out today, so actually starting as soon as you want to put something in. For the summer, I'm going to do something called Hot Topics. And that means I'm going to preach on some of the things you would like to hear me preach on. So I'm going to put out a jar that says Hot Topics, and I've got some little flame-shaped papers um, on which I'll have you write a question, a scripture you want to hear something about, um, a topic that you just want me to touch on. I will ask that you put your name on it and your contact information if you don't think I have it um, correct and updated uh, so that I can contact you if, for instance, maybe your question is broad enough that I don't know that I can handle it in one sermon or if I'm not sure exactly which direction to go, if I want to make sure that you're going to be here on the day that I'm addressing it, uh, things like that. So if you would put your name on it, you don't have to put a phone number unless, like I say, if, you, if you've updated it recently and you don't think I have the correct one. Um, but yeah, so I'll give you that chance through the summer while there's no church holidays or anything like that. And I'll just do them kind of first come, first serve and otherwise follow the lectionary if I don't have one to address. So be thinking about those things you might like to ask, and the jar will show up maybe even today or tomorrow out on one of the tables out here so that you can put those in. Okay, and just as Jesus invited Matthew and those that were called tax collectors and sinners to the table with him, upsetting the religious leaders of that time, he's invited us to his table, the table where he's given the gift of his body and blood, his life, his death, his resurrection for us. And so we will share at the table this morning. <laughs> Your responses will be on the screen. If you'd like to follow along in the hymnal, I begin on page 12 in your hymnal. And by way of invitation, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. If you're following in the hymnal, I'm at the great thanksgiving on page 13. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. 
delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, broke it, blessed it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Servers would come forward. We'll serve each other and then the table will be set for you. We also have a gluten free option if anybody needs it.
begin to reset the table as if the one who wished to be served that you would come forward. together to close our time at the table and also to give thanks for the offerings that have been provided as we've shared. And gracious God, we thank you for the invitation to your table. None of us is, by our own efforts, worthy of that invitation. But by your power and simply because of who you are, you invite us anyway. And now we hear your call to send us forth to be about your work, your work of healing and transformation and bringing joy and blessing to your people. Go with us and help us to know your presence each step of the way as we have need. We thank you for your generous gift of your your Son, Jesus Christ, and for all the gifts you provide each day of these lives you've given us. We've taken the opportunity to give one small part back for your work and for the good of your people. Bless those gifts, the givers, and those who will receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand once more and, and sing together. I'm going to have Barb go ahead and play through this because I think it's new to everyone. Um, and then we'll sing together. Thank you. 
taking the hand of Jesus, walking away and knowing his presence and sharing his word with those around us, as he would call. Amen. Amen.